The April 1st, 2024 Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus, Syria, uh, opens the way for a potentially dangerous escalation across the entire region, which is already on edge because of Israel's continued military operations in Gaza. Now, I just want to point out that attacking another nation's embassy anywhere is an egregious violation of international law. Uh, this is ex explicitly covered by the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations in 1961. And it seems like a clear cut case for the UN Security Council. Yet on April 4th, 2024, UN Security Council fails to condemn strike on Iran in Syria. The United States, Britain and France opposed a Russian drafted UN Security Council statement that would have condemned an attack on Iran's embassy compound in Syria, which Tehran has blamed on Washington's ally Israel. And the explanation the US has for why it did not uh, condemn this attack is because the US has not confirmed the status of the building struck in Dam Damascus, which is just absolute nonsense. And uh, taking that together with this, also, April 4th, 2024, via Newsweek, White House very concerned about prospect of Israel-Iran war. The article says, White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said that Washington is very concerned over escalating tensions between Israel and Iran after a deadly airstrike on the Islamic Republic's embassy in Syria. Speaking with CNN's Wolf Blitzer, Kirby said the White House was concerned over the possibility of tensions between Iran and Israel heightening into a full-scale war in light of the attack, adding, we are all taking this very, very seriously. Nobody wants to see this conflict escalate. But in fact, the U.S. has desperately sought this conflict for many years, and U.S. government and arms industry funded think tanks have written entire policy papers about how to use Israel as a provocateur to drag Iran into a war with the U.S., ultimately with the U.S., that Iran desperately wants to avoid. I'll get into all of that here in just a moment. The U.S. says it's very concerned about this. It says... Uh, it's concerned about this attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. It also says that it's very concerned about Israeli atrocities against civilians and aid workers. We have this from the Washington Post. This helps us sort out what the U.S. is saying and what the U.S. is actually doing. So it says, U.S. approved more bombs to Israel on day of World Central Kitchen strikes. The Biden administration approved the transfer of thousands more bombs to Israel on the same day Israeli airstrikes in Gaza killed seven aid workers for the charity group World Central Kitchen. Three U.S. officials told the Washington Post this week after the incident elicited global condemnation. This all took place at the same time Israel was attacking the Iranian embassy in Syria. The transaction demonstrates the administration's determination to continue its flow of lethal, lethal weaponry to Israel despite Monday's high-profile killings and growing calls for the United States to condition such support on greater protection for civilians in the war zone. A U.S. citizen was among the dead. The State Department approved the transfer of more than 1,000 Mark 82 500-pound bombs, over 1,000 small-diameter bombs, and fuses for Mark 80 bombs, all from authorizations granted by Congress several years before the latest hostilities between Israel and Hamas began, said the U.S. officials. A State Department spokesperson confirms the approval and said it occurred sometime prior to when the Israeli aircraft struck the aid convoy, as if that makes any difference at all. I have pointed out many times how from the very onset of these Israeli military operations in Gaza, the Israeli government and military itself openly said that the intent was to maximize damage, not focus on accuracy. October 10th, 2023, we're focused on maximum damage. Ground offensive into Gaza seems imminent. And at the time, I told people this is not about fighting Hamas. This is about using Hamas as a pretext to erase Gaza. And in hindsight, I think it's very obvious that is exactly what's going on here. And in this Guardian article, it says, IDF spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari made the startling admission that thousands of tons of munitions had already been dropped on the tiny strip, adding that while balancing accuracy with the scope of damage, right now we're focused on what causes maximum damage. Well, if you're focused on causing maximum damage in a densely populated urban environment, you're going to only maximize civilian deaths, not just civilians, trying to go about their day-to-day -day life and survive, but also aid workers that come 
to help them, journalists who come to document their conditions, and anyone else who happens to be there uh, either helping out or simply trying to wait out this military operation who are involved in combat operations in no shape, form, or way. That's what a policy aimed at maximizing damage is going to guarantee. And the U.S. knew this from the onset, and yet they continuously sent Israel weapons. They are enabling these atrocities while publicly denouncing them and trying to distance itself from them. So it's a, a double game the U.S., regularly plays they do the exact same thing with ukraine ukraine carries out terrorist attacks the u.s says they have no idea what ukraine is doing they condemn it all while the cia is working directly with the ukrainian units carrying out these attacks it's it is the same story because it is the same playbook the u.s is using a proxy to destabilize a region of the world. The US is using Ukraine to destabilize Europe so it can reassert itself over the nations of Europe. It is destabilizing the Middle East so it can reassert itself over the nations of the Middle East who are attempting to move out from under US dominion. We saw the, the region slowly transforming over the last several years. US military presence waning, its grip over the region weakening. We saw nations like Iran and Saudi Arabia putting their differences aside to move the whole region forward together. The U.S. is desperately trying to stop this process from continuing. The best way and the only way the U.S. knows how to do that is through military conflict. Rather than provoking it itself, it is using its very eager proxy Israel to do it for them. A lot of these articles about killing aid workers, targeting the Iranian embassy in, in Syria, and all of these other atrocities Israel is, being, is, is carrying out in front of the entire world, uh, we see the Western media always slipping in there, Hamas and October 7th, as, as a, an attempt to obliquely justify whatever Israel is, is doing, whatever its most recent atrocity so happens to be. But as I have pointed out many times before, it was Israel itself, its U.S. sponsors and U.S. Arab allies in the region who maneuvered Hamas into power and built them up into the organization they are today. I want to point out this article all the way back from 2012, Hamas ditches Assad back Syrian revolt. This was Hamas joining the U.S., Turkey, Persian Gulf, Arab ally, and also Israeli sponsored proxy war against Syria. That's what Hamas joined, and that's whose side they joined on, the, the U.S., Turkey, Arab, and Israeli-backed proxies. That's who they were fighting alongside. And we have the Israeli media, because not everyone in Israel supports what the Israeli government is doing, including in the Israeli media. We have articles like this from Paratz. A brief history of the Netanyahu-Hamas alliance for 14 years. Netanyahu's policy was to keep Hamas in power. The pogrom on October 7, 2023 helps the Israeli prime minister preserve his own rule. And more specifically, it helps prevent the prospect of a negotiated peace between Israel and Palestine, the creation of a two-state solution. And it maintains in power in Gaza an irrational, perpetual pretext and provocation instead of a legitimate resistance organization that will actually work to protect the people in Gaza. Is Hamas protecting the people in Gaza or did they hand Israel exactly the pretext it needed to erase Gaza from the map. Again, in hindsight, I think it's quite obvious. This Haaretz article says, for over a decade, Netanyahu has lent a hand in various ways to the growing military and political power of Hamas. And as I read this list of things that have empowered Hamas, you will notice that a lot of it doesn't actually have to do with Israel, it has to do with the US and its Arab allies in the region as well. Israel is just a, a part of this. Netanyahu is the one who turned Hamas from a terror organization with few resources into a semi-state body, releasing Palestinian prisoners, allowing cash transfers as the Qatari envoy comes and goes to Gaza as he pleases, agreeing to the import of a broad array of goods, construction materials in particular, 
with the knowledge that much of the material will be designated for terrorism and not for building civilian infrastructure, increasing the number of work permits in Israel for building civilian infrastructure, increasing the number of work permits in Israel for Palestinian workers from Gaza and more. All of these developments created symbiosis between the flowering of fundamentalist terrorism and the preservation of Netanyahu's role. And what does this look like? A, a microcosm of what the U.S. was doing overall with Al Qaeda and ISIS in the region. The U.S. is illegally occupying, invading and occupying nations uh, across the Muslim world. People desperately want to fight back against it. There are legitimate organizations doing that. And then there is ISIS and Al Qaeda, which channels people's emotions, anger, and energy into ultimately a self defeating. Resi fake, false resistance that ultimately the U.S. controls and uses. Instead of being an obstruction to U.S. foreign policy around the globe, it, it's used as a proxy of its policy and also as a pretext for the U.S. to continue this policy. That is exactly how Israel was using Hamas. And again, as we saw Reuters report, it was uh, literally involved in fighting alongside ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria against the Syrian government and its Iranian and Russian allies. It's very important to keep all of this in mind. Uh, people become extremely emotional when they see the things that Israel is doing to the people of Palestine. People become extremely emotional when they see the things that Hamas has been doing. And that's all done deliberately to, to draw people in emotionally, switch off their ability to, to reason, and analyze what is going on, prevent them from carefully following the money and associations to see what is really behind all of this, and get them sucked into a strategy of tension that ultimately serves U.S. foreign policy objectives in the region. What are those objectives? This is the 2009 Brookings Institution paper, Which Path to Persia? Options for a New American Strategy Toward Iran. If you go to the table of contents, you're going to see all of these different options that were being considered. And if you read all of these chapters carefully, you will realize that from even before this paper was written uh, up to 2009 and then onward, every single one of these options has been pursued by the US. Absolutely every single one of them, almost verbatim. There were several diplomatic options, an offer, Iran shouldn't refuse persuasion, tempting Tehran, the engagement option. And all of this was about the, the so-called Iran nuclear deal. And in these chapters describing these potential deals the U.S. would make with Iran, it admitted that the U.S. would ultimately sabotage these deals. Uh, they would use the deal to make it look as if the U.S. was genuinely trying to pursue peace with Iran. And it was Iran who was determined to to go on the path to war with the U.S. The U.S. would have to reluctantly intervene. They, they openly admit that in this paper. Uh, also, disarming Tehran, the military operations, going all the way, so a U.S. invasion, uh, airstrikes, and they have a whole chapter on using Israel as a proxy. Leave it to Bibi. They're talking about Benjamin Netanyahu, allowing or encouraging an Israeli military strike. Then there's all of these other options that have also been used and are still being used against Iran. Toppling Tehran, regime change, the Velvet Revolution, supporting a popular uprising, inspiring an insurgency. So the U.S. arming militants to fight, kill, and take over the, the uh, Iranian government, supporting Iranian minority and opposition groups. And this chapter, as I pointed out many times before, they specifically mentioned the Mujahideen al khalik In 2009, it was a listed U.S. foreign terrorist organization, they were suggesting that it be used as a U.S. proxy. And they said, if we want to overtly support the MEK, well, we have to take them off the terrorist list. But the, the idea of supporting terrorists to use to advance U.S. foreign policy objectives was a completely acceptable option uh, among the authors of this paper and more widely uh, across U.S. foreign policy circles. And remember, the Brookings Institution is funded by the U.S. government and the largest corporate financier interests in the United States. They also talk about a, a military coup and also the, the option of containing Iran. So I just want to read a few 
it's it's a very long paper it's 170 pages i'm going to read a few uh, different parts of it just to give you an idea of how u.s foreign policy foreign policy makers are viewing this and what they've laid out what the u.s has done since this paper was published and how this current conflict dovetails with this plan that has stretched over years and multiple presidential administrations from the bush administration to the obama administration uh, all throughout the trump administration and now the biden administration it does not matter who is in the white house it does not matter who is in congress every one of these options laid out in this 2009 paper has been pursued before during and after the paper was published regardless of who is in power in washington it's very important to understand that is how u.s foreign policy works and that is why you see continuity of agenda regardless of who is president or who is in Congress. This is what the paper says. 2009, remember, it would be far more preferable if the United States could cite an Iranian provocation as justification for the airstrikes before launching them. Talking about a, a massive air campaign to destroy Iranian military and civilian infrastructure uh, regarding its uh, nuclear program, but also all of its military capabilities, military industrial capabilities. And now think about how Iran is working with Russia regarding the conflict in Ukraine, how much more desperately the U.S. wants to launch these airstrikes, if not to topple the government in Tehran, but to cripple its military industrial capacity by simply bombing it. Clearly, the more outrageous, the more deadly, and the more unprovoked the Iranian action, the better off the United States would be. Of course, it would be very difficult for the United States to go to Iran into such a provocation without the rest of the world recognizing this game, which would then undermine it. What they're admitting is that Iran is not going to attack the US or even Israel. It admits that in this paper. They have to goad Iran into reacting to them. And when Iran reacts, they will cover up their own provocation that goaded Iran in the first place, and they will spin it as if this is unprovoked Iranian aggression. They will use that as a pretext for war with Iran. That is what they're saying. This is one method that would have some possibility of success would be to ratchet up covert regime change efforts in the hope that Tehran would retaliate overtly or even semi-overtly, which could then be portrayed as an unprovoked act of Iranian aggression. So they're admitting that the U.S. is in the middle of supporting subversion, uh, political interference, subversion, even terrorism inside of Iran. And they're saying they could just ratchet that up to a point where Iran would have to react. And then when Iran reacted to that, of course, they would deny subversion, sponsoring terrorism within Iran. And they would claim that Iran is just acting out unilaterally against the U.S. or Israel or any of uh, America's other proxies in the region. It also says, in a similar vein, any military operation against Iran would likely be very unpopular around the world and require the proper international context, both to ensure the logistical support the operation would require and to minimize the blowback from it. The best way to minimize international opprobrium and maximize support, however grudging or covert, is to strike only when there is widespread conviction that the Iranians were given but then rejected a superb offer which goes back to the Iran nuclear deal. One so good that only a regime determined to acquire nuclear weapons and acquire them for the wrong reasons would turn it down. Under those circumstances, the United States or Israel, it says, or Israel in parentheses, could portray its operations as taken in sorrow, not anger, and at least some in the international community would conclude that the Iranians brought it upon themselves by refusing a very good deal. You can see now, how they've tried to do this over the years from 2009 onward. I remember when there was talk of signing the Iran nuclear deal before the US formally agreed to it. I warned people that this was in black and white in this policy paper, that the deal would be deliberately sabotaged and unilaterally walked away from by the US, blaming Iran, and that is exactly what happened. And it, it actually happened over the course of the Obama and and Trump administration. And then uh, Biden vowed on, on the campaign trail that he would re-engage with the Iranians. But of course, they had no intention of ever doing that because the, the, the goal was never to actually negotiate with Iran in good faith. It was to 
draw them into this deal, sabotage it, and then blame Iran for the deal falling apart and use that as an additional pretext to put more pressure on Iran. That's where we are right now, to the point where these covert provocations really aren't working. So now the U.S. and Israel, they're going for very overt provocations, really giving Iran no choice at all but to react. They're, they are creating such an, an emotional narrative in the Middle East that you can see people's emotions taking over and reason, or objectivity is no longer in the driving seat. You see people on both sides of the, the Gaza conflict, people supporting the Palestinians, indifferent to the reality of what Hamas was and their role in provoking all of this. You see people supporting Israel, indifferent to the plight of civilians, claiming that there are no innocent Palestinians, that all of them should be erased from Gaza, genocide essentially. And in, in an environment like that, the US and Israel can openly provoke Iran and the, the media can still spin a narrative where they can still convince at least enough people to believe that somehow, no matter how egregious the provocation openly was against Iran, Iran has no right to respond. That's where we are right now. Let's talk about chapter five, leave it to Bibi, allowing or encouraging an, an Israeli military strike. It says, for the United States, the Islamic Republic of Iran has been an enemy for 30 years, one that has sought to thwart U.S. policies in the Middle East, such as advancing the Arab-Israeli peace process and creating stable regional security agreements, which is all nonsense. E even the people writing this surely don't believe that. Crisis after crisis has arisen between Iran and the United States, but Iran has never been and almost certainly never will be an existential threat to the United States. And what, what they're really trying to say is that the U.S. wants to dominate the Middle East, and they can't because Iran is a powerful independent player in the region, and it refuses to allow itself and its allies to be subjugated by the United States. Somehow, the United States believes that that, that justifies labeling Iran an enemy and seeking to destroy the government in power in Tehran. It harbors no territorial designs on the United States and has never conducted a terrorist operation aimed at the American homeland. And even should it acquire nuclear weapons, lacks the delivery systems to threaten the United States directly. Further, its economy is anemic. Uh, I think that has changed slightly since they wrote this in 2009. And even if substantially reformed, will probably never provide the base for Iran to make itself a challenger to the United States on par with Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, the Soviet Union, or Communist China. This is U.S. policymakers admitting that Iran poses no actual real threat to the United States. It only poses an obstruction to U.S. dominion over the Middle East, a, a region of the, of the planet thousands of miles from U.S. shores. And it, it is an admission, although they're not directly admit it, it's, a, it's an admission that it's the United States traveling to the other side of the planet to, to pick a fight with Iran. Israel's strategic room for maneuver in the region would be constrained by an Iranian nuclear deterrent. In other words, Israel would not be able to uh, murder whoever it wanted, shoot missiles to any country it wants, kill whoever it wants, uh, roll, roll over an entire population, push, push them into the sea, push them into the desert. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to do that as easily if Iran had nuclear weapons. The success of Iranian-backed terrorist groups, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza and the West Bank in the last few years has only added to Israel's concerns. Again, Hezbollah, yes, has strong ties with Iran. Hamas, not so much. Iran wants to influence Hamas and transform it into a legitimate resistance organization like Hezbollah, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, Hamas, is the organization it is today primarily because of US and Israeli machinations done through their intermediaries, their Arab allies in the Persian Gulf. This chapter five, allowing or encouraging an Israeli military strike, it discusses using Israel as a proxy to conduct military strikes against Iran. And elsewhere in the document, it admits that an Israeli strike on Iran could trigger a wider conflict between Israel and Iran, draw in the United States and other countries, which is exactly what the United States wants. 
It cannot be seen to provoke the war itself directly. It's using Israel to provoke the war. When the, the conflict begins, the U.S. will intervene saying, we must stand by our Israeli allies. We have no choice, but we didn't want this war. And they don't have... Uh, they don't have to bear responsibility for provoking the war. They're simply intervening in the middle of an ongoing war. That is exactly what they're trying to do right now. This is exactly why Israel attacked the Iranian embassy in Syria. There's a section in this report on page 82. It's titled, Facing Iranian Retaliation. And this is retaliation for U.S. airstrikes on Iranian territory, if the U.S. were to carry out airstrikes. This is what the paper admits and this is why people should temper their expectations regarding Iran. And if there is some sort of massive attack on Israel, people should suspect a false flag because Iran is in a stronger position now than it, ha than it has been for decades in the region. And that is only going to improve over time. If they can avoid a direct conflict with either Israel or, and or the United States, time is on their side. Time is not on America's side. It is not on its proxies side the administration in israel right now is pursuing unsustainable policies that are going to unravel and more rational more practical uh circles of interest in israel are going to have to take over or israel is going to spiral into the ground this is what the paper even in 2009 admits it would not be inevitable that Iran would lash out violently in response to an American air campaign. So literally, the U.S. with warplanes dropping bombs on Iranian territory openly, admittedly, they're saying that it's not guaranteed that Iran would respond. So keep that in mind. But no American president should blithely assume that it would not. Iran has not always retaliated for American attacks against it. Initially, after the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103 in December 1988, many believed that it was the Iranian retaliation for shooting down of Iran Air Flight 455 by American cruiser USS Vincennes in July of that year. However, today, all the evidence points to Libya as the culprit for that terrorist attack which, if true, would suggest that Iran never did retaliate for its loss, nor did Iran retaliate for America's Operation Praying Mantis, which in 1988 resulted in the sinking of most of Iran's major warships. Consequently, it is possible that Iran would simply choose to play the victim if attacked by the United States, assuming, probably correctly, that this would win the clerical regime considerable sympathy, both domestically and internationally. It also would be strategically smart uh, the u.s can drop bombs on iran but you cannot defeat a nation through an air campaign alone iran can survive that it, it may not survive a conflict it engages in directly with the u.s or israel beyond its borders remember both israel and the united states possess nuclear weapons uh, and i i believe that at the end of the day seeing a window of opportunity closing for the U.S. and its proxies in the region, including especially Israel with those nuclear weapons, the chances of ever using them, that window of opportunity is also closing. The, if the U.S. through Israel can provoke Iran or even stage uh, uh, an attack on Israel and blame it on Iran, maybe they could justify using nuclear weapons on Iran and maybe not successfully overthrow the government. The government may somehow survive, but they would deliver such a devastating blow to its military industrial complex that it would be removed from the board f almost indefinitely in terms of supporting Russia, say in Ukraine or China as the US prepares uh, for war with China in Asia Pacific. Brookings continues, it says, however, it is at least equally likely that Iran would shoot back as best it could. As noted above, Iran may attempt to shut down the Strait of Hormuz in response, but this seems unlikely. Doing so would threaten the international oil market and so lose Iran whatever international sympathy it might have gained for being the victim of an American attack of greater importance, and that's questionable because we can see what's happening in the Red Sea right now with uh, Yemen and their attacks on Israeli-bound shipping and the U.S.-European attempt to protect 
these maritime routes and and their failure to do so and i i really don't see the majority of the world condemning yemen for this of greater importance american air and naval capabilities are so overwhelming that it would simply be a matter of time before the u.s military could wipe out its iranian counterparts and reopen the strait really because uh, the, the united states u.s media the western media are very fond of reminding everyone how how difficult it is for the russian black sea fleet to operate in the black sea uh, because of ukrainian drones naval drones iran has naval drones why wouldn't iran be able to conduct a similar asymmetric campaign against u.s warships and again look at what's happening in the red sea i don't think it would be the overwhelming victory they're imagining in this 2009 policy paper the result would simply add insult to injury for tehran especially given that under those circumstances american naval and air forces available in the persian gulf will be vastly more powerful than is normally the case such a move by the iranians would appear to be playing right into washington's hands well they are making the point that iran trying to fight either the u.s or Israel, or both, in an, in an open, large-scale conflict across the entire region, that would not benefit Iran, and that that is true. It seems far more likely that Tehran might choose to respond in kind, roughly by lobbing ballistic missiles at U.S. bases, oil facilities, and other high-value targets located in the Gulf states, Israel, or other U.S. ally states. This contingency would merit deploying considerable anti-ballistic missile defenses assets in the region and providing as much warning to U.S. allies as possible. And actually, we have seen the U.S. deploy these anti-ballistic missile defenses ahead of the provocations I, I warned people that both the U.S. and Israel would be conducting to try to draw Iran into a war. That was the whole point of the October 7th attacks and Israel's response to them, was to create a conflict that they could continuously build and suck Iran into. And we saw them step by step putting in all of the pieces recommended by this paper ahead of time, uh, anticipating Iran's response. However, because many Iranian leaders would likely be looking to emerge from the fighting in an as advantageous a strategic position as possible, and because they would likely con calculate that playing the victim would be their best route to that goal, they might well refrain from such retaliatory missile attacks. And we have seen from 2009 onward all the way up to today, Iran does respond, but in a very measured and careful way. And they do that very deliberately for all the reasons I just mentioned. Time is on Iran's side. Time is on Russia and China's side. Time is on the multipolar world's side because the multipolar world's time has come. Time is up for the unipolar Western international order. And all Iran, Russia, China, all of their allies in the region and around the world, all they have to do is continue doing what they have been doing. Building while the US bombs, protecting themselves, uh, ensuring their survival while weathering these provocations that aim to draw them out uh, into a conflict that would still play to the advantages the U.S. and its allies, including Israel, still have on the battlefield. I just want to exp I just want to reiterate: the U.S. overthrew the government, the elected government of Ukraine in 2014, and began a destructive conflict in Europe, meant to pry Europe away from Russia and also China. And the U.S. has very successfully done that. The conflict has gone catastrophically for its Ukrainian proxies and has exposed immense weakness across the collective West. But it has allowed the U.S. to reassert dominion over Europe. They are politically captured by the United States. They've been forced to cut their ties with Russia. They're being forced to cut their ties with China. And their future is now locked together with the United States. They see a very similar process taking place in the Middle East, where all of these divisions the U.S. cultivated over the years began to unravel. You saw Iran and Saudi Arabia repairing their ties. We saw the Arab League bring Syria back into the fold. 
We even saw Syria and Turkey talking about resolving many issues, including the ongoing uh, occupation of Syrian territory by Turkey forces. The region is collectively coming together and moving on without the United States. And so just like the U.S. used conflict in Europe and its proxies in Europe to plunge the region into conflict, allowing it to reassert itself over the region, they're trying to do the very same thing in the Middle East. They're using their proxies, uh, and in particular, Israel, to do this. And they want to draw Iran into a very similar conflict uh, that they've drawn Russia into in Ukraine. This is what they're trying to do. And it is all laid out in policy papers spanning many years. This has been the, the policy of the United States. And they can now try to distance themselves from Israel when they attack embassies, when they kill aid workers. But in reality, it is the U.S. primarily enabling Israel to do this in the first place. And according to their own policy papers, they are encouraging Israel to do this to, to escalate, specifically to escalate, uh, not to defuse the situation, not because they're concerned about the prospect of an Israel-Iran war, but because they are trying to provoke one. Please keep all of this in mind as additional events are, are short to follow. Keep all of this in mind when analyzing this. Do not allow your emotions to cloud your judgment and your objectivity the U.S. encourages Israel. The administration in Israel conducts deliberately provocative operations aimed specifically, deliberately at civilians, at aid workers, at embassies, to stir people up emotionally so they cannot think objectively, to, to cloud their minds from what is, what is happening, and to allow the United States to move this policy forward, this policy of dragging the whole region into war. Iran is going to do everything in its power to continue avoiding large-scale war with the U.S. and Israel, just as Syria has, just as Russia has. That will continue because they know time is on their side. The ultimate revenge is going to be ultimately victory. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I post absolutely everything on Telegram. Even if I'm unable to do videos for whatever reason, I'm always posting on Telegram uh, short pieces, links to articles. And I also upload all of my videos in full on Telegram as a backup for platforms like YouTube. So please check that out. Check the video description for all the links that I reference in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize any of my social media platforms. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. If you do want to help support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also through Patreon. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's through one-time donations, donations month to month, or if you have no money to spare and you're just helping share my work with others, all of that is greatly appreciated. That is what allows me to continue doing this work. So thank you. As always, thank you for watching.